Hello and welcome to our training today presented by Deluball Software. Today we'll be working in our structural analysis and design software RFM6. So this will be a two-day training taking course for a couple hours today and a couple hours tomorrow geared at universities, including students, professors, and instructors. My name is Amy Heilig. I'll be just giving a brief introduction today for this training. I'm the CEO of the US office located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'll then turn it over to my colleague, Alex Bacon, who will be your trainer. He's a technical support engineer, also located in the Philadelphia office. And finally, we have Siska Choa, who will be helping out with all questions today. She's a technical support engineer also located in Philadelphia. So if the control panel does seem to get in your way when you logged into this GoToWebinar, you can certainly hide it with the orange arrow up at the top. But we want everyone to ask questions throughout this training. So you can actually do so within this dialog box under the questions options. So Cisco will be helping out with those questions and Alex will be answering them at the designated breaks today, but as they come up, feel free to type them into this input box here. So I just want to briefly explain the program configuration option. So RFM6 is the base program. This allows us to fully integrate with BIM software such as AutoCAD, Revit, Tecla. You can fully model your structure. You can apply loads to the structure. And finally, you can run a calculation to get the full analysis. So from the analysis, we would get information like deflections, internal forces, uh, support reactions. But in addition to this, we have multiple add-ons. And the add-ons that we have, you can see a few of those listed here. This is not a full list, but just a select few, allow us to carry out the design Design. So, for example, for steel, concrete, or timber, we have the U.S. codes, the Canadian standards, and other international standards to take your structure and to actually carry out the design process. Now, we have several other add-ons as well, for example, dynamic analysis, stability, and so on. Uh, it should be known that with the university or student licenses, you do get access to RFEM and all add-ons that we have to offer. So universities, including professors, students, instructors, all have access to a free full RFM6 license. And as mentioned, this is not only the base program, but all additional add-ons that we offer as well. Now the licenses should be used for teaching or learning purposes. If you are wanting to use it for something like funded research, we certainly have options for that uh, for different licensing. So feel free to contact us either through email or phone to discuss the options there but alternatively with teaching and learning purposes free full licenses are provided now this can be installed directly on your personal computer so for example if you're a student and you have your own personal laptop we can provide access to that license directly on your laptop but also the License can be installed on a school computer. So for example, if you're a professor or in a lab type setting, if you need access to 20, 30, 40 different licenses in a lab setting, we can certainly accommodate this as well. The licenses will be valid for one year. After that year, there is an opportunity to renew as well for the upcoming academic year. We also will provide access to all program updates. So we currently come out with a release every week with RFM 6. So as a professor or student, you'll have access to the latest program version throughout that year. We also provide free email technical support. So if you have questions while you're working through the program, um, any technical questions that you might have, you can email us at info-us at and we'll be happy to help 
help you. So if you are wanting to request a license, you can do so directly through our website at delubal.com. Up at the top of the page, there is an education tab you can click on that allows you to request uh, access to an RFM6 license, whether you're a professor, instructor, or a student. And with that said, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Alex now to continue on with the training. Great, thanks Amy for the introduction and all of the info and details on that. So today, well, this is the content over for the two days for today and tomorrow. We'll first start out with going over the basic principles of FEA. And then <clears throat> after that, we'll go into uh, our first model example. And I'll go over the basic UI and everything of RFM. And then we'll get into this continuous slab example where we'll go over um, FE mesh and plate theory and learn how to draw surfaces and create members. And then towards the end of today, we will probably start the design it add-on example, which is the example you're looking at right now on this slide and this is will where we'll use this example to go over a couple other elements with mod with regards to modeling um, but the focus of this example is to learn how to use the design add-ons and we'll just go over the basics and we'll be designing timber concrete and steel so there will be uh one break uh at the one hour mark for five minutes. And um, during that break, like Amy said, any questions that may that can't be answered in the chat, uh, I'll ask Cisco if there's any um, larger questions that I can go over during this break. So there, yeah, five minute break uh, halfway through, and then we'll have another discussion period at the uh, end of the two hours. Uh, I do have a question, and if you could just post it in the in the question section of uh, the GoTo webinar panel, uh, do you plan on modeling along? And this will just help me know what the pacing should be for today. Um, if you have another screen that you can work with, if you're planning on modeling along, um, that is an option. And I do want to also mention that. If you're modeling along, I can't stop and help you with any of your modeling um, inquiries. So, yeah, if you could, um, yeah, if you could post that or in the question section, then I can get an idea of how the pacing should go. I'll just give everyone a half a minute or so, maybe looking for the question section. But I see, thank you, Mary. No. Okay. All right. Uh, awesome. Well, I'll just I'll go at a at a normal pace. So thank you, ever thank you for participating in that. Thank you. All right. Um. Next question, have you, how much have you learned about FE yet? F, or I'm sorry, FEA yet in any of your classes? Um, you can post yes or no. If, if you haven't learned anything about FEA yet, um, then no. If you have learned or you have a general knowledge of FEA, then if you could put yes or no in the questions again, that would be great. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's used to my, yeah. All right. So half and half, it seems. Nice. Okay, good. Thank you guys for participating in that. Um, great. So this is good to know for either if you have learned or you haven't learned about FEA yet, I think you'll find, I think everyone will find something, something in this presentation and training. So great. Thank you guys for, for, doing that. So yeah, let's just start. So we're going to start off with the basic principles of FEA. So 
First, computer software, that includes our software, is based on the displacement method. Um, so if you haven't learned about FEA yet, or you have learned about F F have learned about it, um, there are two basic methods for FEA. Um, the most common method and the method that RFM uses is the um, displacement method. And this method is where the displacements or the deformations are the unknowns in the system of equations that we use. Um, and therefore, the displacements are calculated. So um, all other results and then all other results like forces and stresses are then calculated in the um, post processing. So then there's the second method, which is the force method. And this is kind of the opposite of the displacement method. And this is where the forces are the unknown. And then afterwards, um, the displacements are determined in the, in the post-processing. So most use the displacement method, um, just like RFM does. So also analytical solutions um, are difficult when it comes to large complicated structures. So real structures require pages and pages of calculations compared to the simplified examples that are normally shown in structural analysis classes and static classes. And so this is why the FDA method was developed and because so we can decompose those structures um, into a mesh of finite interconnected elements. And um, a lot of, this is when a lot of smaller elements are used and with a standardized, with standardized stiffness parameters, um, structures, so yeah, structures are modeled and converted into finite interconnected element mesh. Um, material and cross-section properties are then given at, at each of these FE nodes. And these standardized stiffness relations um, can be described in a small equation at each of these nodes, which is then solved very quickly. Each of these smaller equations are solved very quickly um, with computers very easily. So that's how we get very um, quick solutions for these easy equations. Uh, mechanical behavior at these nodes is then transferred between elements. So you can say this is how the properties, um, the properties are described as a continuum at each of the nodes. And then um, approximations are used to describe the mechanical behavior which is basically what we learn in physics and our um, mechanics classes and things like that. So that's kind of the gist on how the FEA method is was created and how it works. So this last word down here, discretization, um, I think is a very uh, interesting vocabulary word, discretization, the meaning of it, it's almost a verb or it is a verb, uh, structures being submeshed into finite elements. So basically these large complicated structures you would say are being discretized or, discretiz or using discretization, which is structures being submeshed into finite elements basically. So that's a word that's used um, in FEA terminology. So here is the FEA calculation workflow. Um, you can see in the diagram on the right-hand side, uh, this is kind of the cycle basically. So first we take the structure and we break it down into a mesh or we mesh the structure and we determine the local element stiffness properties. And then the next step, there we go, the next step, um, then the stiffness properties are transferred to a global coordinate system and you get those stiffness relationships for each of the elements. And then these are assembled to get the global stiffness, the global stiffness matrix of the whole structure. So this is our big system of equations that the computer then solves. Four step. So this is where, this is very important. This is where we add and we implement our support conditions or we 
add in our boundary conditions in the form of supports or external forces. And then the computer can then solve this system of equations and determine the displacement vectors. And last step, once the system of equations is solved, then the internal forces are calculated as part of the post-processing. So you get your internal forces, um, your deformations, and all of the static analysis results that you're looking for. And that's, that's where you, that's the end of it. So that is the FEA calculation workflow. And next, I have a question um, that again, if you guys could answer in the chat, that would be great. So the question is, what is discretization? Um, you got three choices there and you can just type in A, B or C and I'll just kind of get a gist for if everyone's on the same page. Okay, so so it looks like a lot of you guys are saying C. So the correct answer is actually A, a structure that is converted into finite elements. So C, submeshing finite elements into smaller elements. Um, yeah, I could see how that's, I could I could see that's a little like confusing at first when you read it, but yeah. The correct answer is A, a structure that is converted into finite elements discretization. So good. All right. Um, now we can get into our first example and hop into the program. So this first example is going to be this model right here, very basic. Um, just for example purposes, we call it a continuous plate example. Um, the topics that will be covered will be FE mesh design, convergence behavior, we'll be comparing the beam element to the surface elements and seeing how those two compare and how they differ. And then we'll go over FE mesh size and how and what the best FE mesh size is or how to determine what your FE mesh size should be. And then we'll get into some results such as uh, distribution of internal forces. We'll go over shear stiffness, which is going to be a big topic. And then we'll go over the result smoothing as well. So I'm going to switch into RFM. And now, uh, cool. Yeah, so this is RFM. This is our FEA program that Amy just spoke about. And right now we're just in the, the base program. And I have that model, that example model open right now. This is what we're going to, to model in this first part of today. So I just, with right now, I just wanna go over the GUI or the, the user interface. So I think the, the three main important sections of our program is we'll start with our panels here. So I have um, the navigator panel here. Then this is the tables panel down here at the bottom. And then for results, this panel is our control panel on the right hand side. And so these are the three main panels along with the toolbar at the top. And we'll start by going over this navigator uh, panel on the left-hand side, which is uh, probably the most important, useful um, panel here. This is where you'll be. This is basically where the whole entire model is organized into these folders here. And each of these folders, if there is an arrow next to them and you can expand it, you can see we have our materials for this whole entire model and we have our sections, thicknesses, and nodes, every single node. And when you click on one of these, you can, uh, well, you can kind of see that it highlights that material. So all of these are highlighted. And yeah, so this is basically where everything's organized and we'll obviously be getting to this in more detail as we start modeling. Um, but main, mainly there are four tabs at the bottom of this panel. 
So right now, this is our data. This is all of our data. We're in our, our data tab here. All of the model data is organized here. But then we have our second tab, which is our display tab. And under the display tab, this is where, so if I right click, I can collapse all of these. And this is where you can turn on or off um, basically any graphics uh, that are displayed in the work window here. So I could turn off, um, I can turn off the results. So if I uncheck model, then all of my, all of these uh, graphical display objects here are turned off graphically. Our model is still technically there, but just graphically it's turned off. So if you want to turn off certain things like lines, nodes, members, uh, you can turn those off here. So this is where anything you want to control graphically, you can turn on or off graphically in this tab. Uh, third tab here is our views tab. And this is where you can control the, this is where you can control what you're viewing in the graphical area here. So down here, visibilities, you can turn this on and now you can see the model is all gone. Let's say we only want to show members and we only want to show the members that are made of concrete. We can check that on. And so now you see this member made of concrete is now the only thing shown. So that's kind of how the visibilities works. If you have a very large model, you can um, use this to kind of just find what you're looking for or just display what you're looking for. So we'll just turn that off. And then up here, you can create your own custom uh, user defined views. So you can click this button and create a new user defined view and have those created here. So pretty handy. And then if I turn our results back on, we have our fourth tab here, which is our results tab. And right now you can see we're looking at our static analysis, which is giving us our global deformations and we can go through and turn on results for members and results for surfaces. So this results tab is basically where you'll be living if you're analyzing your model and you're checking on and off results that you would like to see. Next, we have at the top our toolbar, which is you can see all of these buttons at the top. You can organize these buttons any way that you like. You can move them around, and take, take them out and put them in and put them wherever you want. Um, I usually just, if I, you can right click anywhere in this space up here um, and you can hit restore default layout. And basically it'll put the buttons in the, or the tools in the same layout that you, I'm showing right now. So I like this layout, um, it, you know, muscle memory, everything's where I think it should be. So that's handy. And you can also right click and you can customize this menu, menu toolbar, and you can take any of these buttons here um, if you see something that you like that you find useful and you want it to be very easy to get to, you can just take these and you can drag them up here and put them wherever you want. So that's how you can that's the toolbar, and we'll get to know this more as we start modeling. Um, but we'll move on from that for now. Up here is the menu bar. So this is pretty familiar with if you're working with pretty much any like Windows or Mac application, they all have this menu bar up here where we have file, edit, view, um, insert is probably, if you're ever looking for a tool in the toolbar and you can't find it, I would just go to insert and you can see um, our tools are all, all organized by these categories here. So that's a handy menu and then calculate is also a handy menu. So yeah, that's the menu menu bar. And then I'm going to turn the tables back on. Down here we have the tables, which is basically um, you could you could model a whole model down here numerically if you wanted to in the tables. So we have the drop down here where everything's organized. This first option structure 
we can just go to that. <clears throat> and then under basic objects, you can see we have all of our basic objects. Um, we have all of these tabs down here for each object. So materials, I only have one material defined. Sections, I only have one section defined. The thickness, these are all of our nodes. Um, if you click on one of these down here, then that element will be highlighted up there. And you can also, um, never mind. Yeah, the element will be highlighted in the graphical view on anything that you select. So you can edit, you can edit um, anything down here. For example, my member, I could change the member type or the section distribution. I could also create a new member if I wanted to. I would have to create a line first, but anyway, yeah, the table down here you can use to numerically model anything. So that's the table. And then this control panel we'll get into a little bit later with results. But yeah, so that's the basic overview of the program. And so now if you're planning on modeling along, this is where we will start. So I'm gonna go up here and now we're gonna create a new file. So you can either go up here to file, new, or you click on this new model button here at the top left. So I'm going to click on that. And this is where we're going to create our continuous plate model. And this is this is our base data dialog box. And this dialog box in the first tab here will work with the first tab and make our way to the right. And the main tab is where we're going to name our model. So I'm going to name it continuous plate example. Uh, and then I'm going to put a random number at the end so I don't overwrite any of my other ones there. So that's the name. You can also add a model description. So um, yeah, you can do that, add a model description. And then also we have a projects tab here. So you can create projects. Basically um, they're a link to a folder on that's saved locally to your computer. So if I click on create new project here, can name it. Um, you can have even uh, higher folders where you can organize all your projects. And then you can choose where you want this project to be organized um, on your computer. So you just have to choose a file location there. And that's how you can create a new project. And then we also have the Dilubal Center where you can organize your project folders but we're not going to get into this today so i'm going to exit out of that next we have the type of model so you can you can create um strictly 2d models and strictly 1d models in rfm so for this example it's going to be a 3d model so basically what that means is that all um, degrees of freedom are accessible so if but if we wanted to create a 2d model in the xz plane we could do that and so we wouldn't have to worry about the rotation about the x-axis or if we chose an xy plane those rotations would be locked and then you can do just a 1d member example as well so those options are there. Uh, we're just going to choose 3D. And that's, those are, yeah, basically the main things that you want to choose there to get your model set up. Um, this second tab here, as you can see, it says add ons. Like Amy mentioned, the base program that we were just looking at here is for just the static analysis, giving you the general analysis of the model but when it comes to design this is where you would choose you can see we have our design add-on category so we'll be getting into this later with our other example but this is where you would choose your design add-ons we also have some other analysis add-ons um, good to know this is our add-ons tab we're not going to activate any now but we are actually going to turn off so this is these this button 
or this option, combination wizard and classification. So if you have this checked on, the program will automatically create load combinations based on the selected standard that you have. So under standards tab here, right now I have the, under my standard group, I have the ASC7 selected. You can see that we have other standard, we have a long list of international standards here that you can choose from. Um, but for this example, I'm going to turn both of these options off because we're not going to be using any type of standard. So we don't need to select the standard under here, but this is also where you would select the standard for your design add-ons as well. Uh, this tab we can skip and we'll move to the settings and options tab. Here you have some, if you wanna get into the finer details of some parameters here for gravity acceleration, model tolerances, member representatives. Um, we're not going to worry about any of this here. We're gonna leave this all as default. What we will do and make sure is that the global axis system, I keep mine where the global Z axis is orientated upwards. I know um, internationally that's that differs, but this is where you can choose if you want it to be upwards or downwards. And then each element in RFM, member surfaces, et cetera, have their own local axis system. And that's um, denoted by a lowercase letter. And I wanna keep my lowercase, my local Z axis set to upward as well. So that's where you can choose your axis system there, the orientation of it. One more thing before we before we uh, click OK and have our model created are units. So units can be really changed um, anywhere at any time in the program. Um, but we do any of the dialog boxes you're in and you want to change the units, there's this button down here that says units and decimal places. And if I click on that, then we can see so like, for example, I'm looking at the gravity, I'm looking at the acceleration of gravity, which is in feet per um, second squared. And the nice thing about this units um, tool here or window is that you can see there are these red arrows. So whatever dialog box you're in, these red arrows will tell you what, um, what general, um, point you're looking at or general um, description or whatever you're trying to change, it'll point to. So you can see gravity, gravitational acceleration here is being pointed at. But anyway, if you're changing, if you wanna work in metric, you can change that here. So right now for this example and for this training, I'm going to be working in imperial units. But if you wanna change the metric, you can go down here to this button called load save template. And you can see here you can set the met you can set metric as default, or you can set imperial units as default, or you can just click. I could click on metric and click OK, and then everything will be moved over to metric. So that's where you can change back and forth between the two, and you can also with this button even create your own template. So um, if you change any of these units or decimal places here and you wanna keep those for all of your projects, um, you can create a love save, um, you can create a template, and then that template will be saved under the list of templates for your units. So I'm going to keep mine in Imperial, and now we can click okay. And this will bring us into a blank model and this is where we can start modeling. So right now you can see I have a blank, I have a blank grid here with my global axis system in the middle of it. Um, you can see my model name here and the navigator data and under my basic objects. I do have under the basic objects, you can see here I have some materials, sections and thicknesses that were carried over from previous projects. So. That is nice, um, but for 
example purposes, it's not. So I'm going to delete them so we can redefine, learn how to redefine um, material sections and thicknesses. So I'm going to delete them. If you see, yeah, we're going to delete them. And so now we don't have anything. Our model is completely blank. We don't have anything defined. Now we can um, start with some basics before we get into actually creating some surfaces and members. First thing to look at is you can see our grid here. Um, we have our points here. And if you, what we wanna do is edit this grid. So we're gonna go up here to settings of work plane. And under these settings, we can edit or change the number of grid points that we have. So right now we have, we have 30 by 30 in the positive and negative directions. I want to change that to 100 grid points. So I want 100 grid points in the positive and negative directions. And then you can also see you can change the spacing of your grid points. So right now I have mine spaced at one foot. And yeah, so you can change all of this and you can also pretty much basically like the units that I was talking about, you can load a save template and you can also um, save your own template. So if you edit these and you're gonna be using them and they're all gonna be the same for each of your projects, you can save a template. Um, I'll just call it example. And then whenever you, so then whenever you open a new pro or new model, you can set that as default and then you can have a list of templates that you, you know, want to switch to. And then you don't have to always redefine this. So I'm going to click OK. And now you can see, hopefully you can see that my grid here is a lot bigger. And I have 100 grid points in each direction and they're all spaced at one foot. So this just makes modeling graphically a lot simpler. Good to adjust your grid settings. And so now I'm going to show you guys how to create a, how to model a surface. So to start off, there's plenty of ways to model a surface, but I think the you know most general way is to go to this tool up here. You can see right here, the icon says new rectangular surface. That's what we're gonna be making is a rectangle. So we can just click on that, but I do wanna just point out that there are other options if I click this drop down arrow right here. So we have rectangle, uh, triangle, circle, and then this one, select boundary. You could use, you could create just some lines and then select those lines as a boundary and create a surface like that. But we're going to create a rectangular surface. And once I click on that button, you can see this new rectangular surface dialog box pops up. And <clears throat> first we're gonna choose our stiffness type here. Um, we don't actually need, we can just leave the stiffness type as standard. There are other stiffness types that I'm not gonna go over at the moment, but we will be talking about one of these later. Standard stiffness type is what we want to keep. and Next, the next little section here says thickness with material. So this is where we don't have any thicknesses created. Um, so we want to create a new thickness and you can do that by clicking on this button here, create a new thickness, or I can just click on the box here. And this is gonna open the new thickness dialog box where we need to define a thickness and material for our surface. So you can see there's other thickness types. We're just gonna keep it uniform. Um, yeah, uniform. And now we need to, we don't have any materials defined yet in our file here. So we need to create a new material. And you can do that by just simply going to this button here, import from material library. You can create your own user-defined material, but we're not going to do that. We're going to import it in from our material library. So when I click on that import from material library button, 
this is our material library. And you can see here, I have it filtered by region right now to United States, but you can filter it to other regions. I'm just going to choose United States uh, for this example training. And material type, you can choose any material type here. Concrete is what I'm going to go with. Um, and then you can have it based on a standard. So I'm going to choose ACI 318 and 19. So now you can see after I filtered all of that, we're just down to concrete here. And I'm going to choose obviously concrete. And then I can choose the have the strength of the concrete. So I'm just going to choose 4,000 PSI for the concrete strength. Click OK. And now you can see we have our new material here created. We have our basic material properties here on the right hand side. And there was one thing. Yeah. So before we move on from creating this new material, um, for this is strictly for example purposes, but you can check on this option here, user defined material. And what this will allow you to do is you can see when I when I check it on, this new tab up here, stiffness modification will pop up uh, along with, yeah, that'll pop up. And then there's also this tab here, material values. And before we weren't able to edit these material values when this was checked off. So when that's off, you have your material values here, but you can't actually edit them. So if you wanna actually be able to edit your material values, you wanna check on user defined material. And so now we have here our modulus elasticity, shear modulus, poisons ratio, which is actually what I want to change. I want to change the poisons, poisons ratio um, from 0 0.2 to just zero. And again, this is just for example purposes for this training. Um, this just allows us to get equal distribution of results across our surfaces. So I'm going to click OK. And now we have our material set for our thickness, and now we can choose the thickness. Um, this one, these slabs are gonna be 12, 12 inches thick. And so now I can click okay. And so now we have our material thickness, and then we also have our thickness. So yeah. Now what we can do, you can see we have some other options here. We don't need to worry about them. We can simply just click OK. And so now you can see I have my cursor has changed this reticle. And I'm able to snap to any of these grid points very easily. So now what I can do is I, all I have to do is tell the program, uh, give it two points for this rectangular surface. So I'm going to left click on the origin here. And then I'm going to uh, snap to the, I'm going to make this slab, let's see, I'm going to make it 16 feet by 32 feet. So I'm going to go down here to 32 feet, and then I'm going to move up to 16 feet in the Y, left click again. And now you can see we have, we have our surface. So I'm going to right click and that's going to that right click anywhere is canceling out the tool. And yeah, so now we have our surface here. It is strictly a 2D element. It has a thickness, but you can see it's strictly just a 2D element. It's just lines and we have our surface along with our four nodes to define it. And now what we want to do is create a couple more of these because we want to have four of them. But before we do that, I think it's easier to just move on. And what we want to do now is support this surface. Um, at the beginning, middle, we, we want to have a middle span support and end support. So, I'm going to add some supports to this surface. 
they're going to be line supports. So this whole first line here is going to be supported along the entire length. So up here we have a couple of different support options under this tool or in the toolbar. We have a nodal support if you just wanted to support one single node. We have our line support, and then we also have a surface support. So what we want to do is choose the line support option. And so this is kind of what I talked about in the presentation with FEA, with the workflow right now, we're defining our boundary conditions. So for our line supports here, this line support dialog box will pop up and it's asking us to choose a line number. We can do that graphically, but we can also choose our line support too. So we have two uh, predefined support options. We have a hinge support option where it's a hinge support. So um, the first three degrees of freedom, the translational directions are fully fixed and only the rotation, all, of, all three degrees of rotation are released. So that's the hinge. And then we have rigid where everything is just fully fixed. So that's what a rigid support looks like. And this is what a hinge support looks like. And you can also create a new line support. Um, and you can define your own line support by choosing which um, degrees of freedom you want to be fixed. So if you want to fix something, you check it on. Uh, if you want to fully release, you uncheck it. So for this first side of the plate, it's going to be, we want to choose hinge. So we don't need to create a new user-defined one. We can just use the hinge one. And you might be thinking, oh, we didn't select our line number or the, the line that we want to assign this to. But I clicked OK, and you can see, hopefully, that there is a little icon next to my uh, cursor here. And when I hover over any of these lines, it's letting me choose the line. This makes it really easy to just graphically assign supports to anything. So you can just graphically choose which lines you want your supports to go to. I'm going to right click and X out of that. We also, so now we have this one side here fully supported along the line here. And what we want to also do is have another line support directly down the middle. So what I need to do is create a new line element. And I can do that by going up here to this tool, new line. So I'm going to click on that and this window will pop up and you can see I can just simply draw the line anywhere I want. Um, very handy right now. I can snap to the mid span of this line here, which is super helpful because I can just click on it and then I can snap to the other mid span. So now I know that my line is completely in the middle of my surface there. So I can just keep right clicking to exit out of that. Um, and now we want to assign our line supports, or we want to assign another line support to this line and this line. So we're going to go up here to the button again, assign line support. And we want to create a new line support because either, we can't use either of these. Um, so we're going to create a new line support. And with this one, with this line support, we want it to be able to roll in the X direction, basically. So it's basically a hinge support, just it's able to move in the X translational direction here. Um, a little more in depth with supports, you can see you can have a spring constant. So if the if that direction isn't fully fixed or fully released, it's somewhere in the middle, you can add a spring constant. Um, and then there's also some nonlinearities, which really get into the weeds here. We're not going to go over any of these today, um, but you can choose. You can create some nonlinear supports uh, with each rotation and translational direction. But for this, this is the definition we want the translational X direction released and our directions in the global Y and Z axes to be fixed and then rotation is all released. So we can click OK, click OK again. And now we want to select both of our lines there. 
And yeah, so now we have our line supports. We have this this concrete slab here is fully is fully uh, supported the way we want it to be. Um, so continuing on with defining our boundary conditions, now we want to load the structure, quote unquote structure. We want to load this concrete plate. Um, and this is where we get into load cases and load combinations. Um, so right now in this drop down here, you can see I have one load case, which is called self weight. Um, if I go to here, I can hit edit active load case. So that'll, and this will bring up our load cases and combinations dialog box. And I'm under the tab load cases and load cases in the program, any loading or force that you apply to the model has to be assigned to a load case. So for this example, we only need one load case. We're not going to create any load combinations or worry about that right now. Um, we're just focusing on one load case. It doesn't have any action type or anything. Um, it's actually not even gonna have self weight. So in a load case, you can see here, um, self weight is activated, um, but we can uncheck that. We don't want self weight to be activated just for this example. Um, and every load case, runs all is run according to a geometrically linear static analysis um by default you can change that if you want so this this all of this all these calculations static analysis for this for this example model will just be strictly strictly linear so we only need one load case and it's going to be to, going to be linear so we'll click okay and so now while under this load case we can, while under this low case, any loading or force that we apply to this, to this model here is going to be assigned to that load case. So now we want to assign a loading to this. We want to put an area load on this entire surface here. And you can see here, this little um, section of the toolbar is where a lot of our loading options are. We have a couple different ones, uh, nodal loading, a line load, member loads, and a new surface load or surface loads. And a surface load is actually what we want. So I'm going to click on the new surface load button. And under this new surface load, we want to choose the load type, which is gonna be force. Um, we have some other options for load distribution. We're going to keep that uniform. And the direction is going to be in the global Z direction. So now we have our magnitude here. What is the magnitude of this loading going to be? And you can see I have it in KSF, kips per square foot. Um, so I'm going to enter in kips per square feet what the magnitude should be. And for this, we're going to make it zero, negative 0 0.210. Negative is telling the program what direction um, or what orientation in the z-axis the loading will be. And now we can simply either, if you know the number of the surface you want to assign the loading to, you can type that in here, for example, Surface one is what we would apply to. You can you can also click on this button here to select the um, surfaces or surface graphically if you want. And then, um, so now if I click okay, I entered surface one. Uh, you can see that our loading was applied to our plate here, our uniform area load point to one zero kips per square foot. Um, you can right click on this area load and you there's a slider here if you want to just um, minimize the graphic. Yeah, minimize the graphic. It doesn't actually adjust the magnitude. If you want to adjust the magnitude, you can double click on it and you can edit it. So now our plate here is fully loaded, supported. Um, and yeah, next thing to move on to 
is creating multiple plates now. So what we can do is take this one plate, we can drag from right to from right to left to select the entire thing. <clears throat> and then we have a tool. We have some tools up here that are similar to something like AutoCAD, if you're familiar with AutoCAD. Um, we have a move slash copy tool here. So I highlighted everything and I'm going to choose that tool. And I'm going to, I want to create a copy of what I've selected here. So I'm going to create a copy. And the number of copies is going to be, we're going to create, we want to create three more of what I selected here. And now it's asking me how I want to displace these copies, what, where they, where should they go? So we can use the displacement vector to tell the program where to put these, how to space out these copies. Um, we want these copies just to follow a singular line in the X direction. And I want to have them spaced um, five foot from each other. So if our, <clears throat> if our plate here is 32 feet long, um, I want to add five more feet to that to space them five feet apart. So I'm going to type in 37 feet here, and you could also just type in five feet here for spacing, um, but that's fine. So I'm going to click OK. And so now you can see we have three more copies of our example plate here. And I'm just going to take these, um, highlight them all, and I just want to drag and drop them, just move them over a little bit like that. And so now we have all of our plates here with the correct loading applied. Um, so now, before we get into the rest of this modeling, um, we're approaching the one hour mark. So I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint. Um, and we're not doing this question yet. Um, so are there, if there's any questions, Siska, from the chat before we go to break that you weren't able to answer? Um, Hi, can... Alex. Yeah. Hi, uh, we do have a question. Can you show how to view the controlling load combinations when you have multiple um, load? Say that you have multiple load cases or combinations, and you want to find out the maximum uh, deformation. Okay, um, I might hold that question to later when we get into the results, if that's if that's fine. Just because we don't have um, any, we only have one load combination for this model. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Hold that then for, we can yeah. show that later. Yeah, yeah. I'll hold that for later. So, is there any um, any other ones? Um, no, that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we'll, hold, we'll when we go over results, um, that will be in a later model. Then we can go over how to see the, the maximum deformations. But, yeah, so now I think is a good time to take a five-minute break. Um, so, we can... You can come back here in five minutes. So um, yeah, take a break, use the bathroom, get some coffee, whatever you gotta do. Um, and we'll resume in five minutes.
All right, so let's resume now. Um, five minute break. So next thing we want to do now is create our concrete beam. I'm going to exit out of the tables just to give us more space here. Um, so making sure. Okay, yeah. So we're going to create a concrete beam now, which is going to be which we're comparing our uh, concrete slab here to. So to create a new member in RFM, you want to go up here to this button called New Single Member. And this new single member dialog box will pop up. You can see here, we can choose the member type. We're going to choose beam. So this, this member type um, allows the member to take on both tension and compressive forces. So this is what you would choose if you were drawing a column or a beam, you would choose this beam member type because it, um, can handle tension or compression, and it transfers um, full forces. So some other ones here, we're not going to go over any of these at the moment. We're gonna stick with beam. And then under the second tab here, uh, section, it's going to be a uniform section. And down here, we want to choose the section um, and the material. So the member start, you can see there's a, it says add member start, add member end. You only really need to focus on add member start to, to create your section of material. You can have, um, you can have your beam, you can have multiple different, two different sections at the starter end, but we're just going to create a new section by importing it in from our section library. So if I click on that button, kind of similar to our material library. We have our section library here with our standardized sections. We have built up sections, thin walled sections, bars, massive, massive two. Um, we're just going to be focusing on our massive rectangular section here. So we can click on that. And then we can choose the material we want. We already defined our concrete material here so we can choose that and use it for our beam as well and then in our second tab here parametric massive we want to choose our dimensions so the base of our beam here is going to be 40 inches wide and the thickness of it is going to be 12 inches so you can see here we have this um, flat section here and so now we can click ok and so now we have our section and our material for the section start here. Um, and you can also change the material down here. And then if you have multiple sections, you can choose them here. And the drop down, if you have multiple materials, you can choose them. And so, oops, sorry about that. And so now we're going to click OK. And basically, I just want this beam to also be um, five feet from my from my slab here so i'm just going to start drawing it five feet from the slab so one two three four five right here and it's also and it's going to be 32 feet in length in the x direction add a node or i could add a node by simply going to create a new node and i could just Click on the mid span there and add a node. Or you can also right click on a member and go to members. And then we can go to divide member. And then we can divide our member either by a distance or we can divide it by a number of nodes. Um, so I'm going to choose this um, intermediate, a number of intermediate nodes. I simply just want to add one node to the mid span. There's some options down here. I want to check on this option. I want to create this node as an on member node. And this allows me to add the node without dividing the member. So I'm going to click OK. And so now we have this node here. You can see, hopefully, you can see um, if I change this to a wireframe view, you can see that this node here hopefully is blue. 
or hopefully you can see that it's blue. And what that means is that it's an on member node type. So it's simply just there for defining our line or for defining our nodal support. You can see these red nodes here on the surface lines and the member line there that red means it's a standard node, which is just to define the, the boundary of the line. Okay, so now we're gonna choose nodal support again. And this time we actually want to create a new nodal support. And now we want to, we want to do for this support is we also want it to be rolling um, in the X direction. So we can click OK for that and click OK again and add our node there. And we also want to do the same thing for our end node here. So they're rolling or released in the X translational direction. And one thing to note for this beam here is you can see that for this beam or for this member, it is fully released about its local X axis, as you can see the local X axis here uh, with each of these node supports. So if I tried to run this, if I tried to run the results for this beam, I would get an instability because in the program size, this member here is able to just infinitely rotate about its X axis. So at least one of these supports needs to have the X, the rotation about the X axis fixed. So what I can do is I can double click on this first support here, I can edit it, clicking the little hand there, which indicates editing it. And I can simply fix the X rotation. So that's what it looks like when the X rotation is fixed. So I'll click OK, click OK again. And so now you can see it's fixed there. And so now our beam is supported how we want it to be. And so now that we have all of our elements here supported, now I want to get into talking about FE mesh. Um, once you get all your boundary conditions figured out with loading, oh, we actually, sorry, I did forget to load this beam. So we don't have any loading on it right now. I actually do want to do that. So for a beam, for a member, um, it's a little, it's not straightforward with the surface. There's the new line, new line load tool, which you can't use for a member. This, whoops, the new line load tool is used for mostly defining um, line loads on the uh, parameter of a surface. For a member, you want to use the new member load tool. So we'll click on that. And under new member load, this looks very similar to the new surface load. We can choose our load type, which will keep this force. We'll keep it a uniform distribution in the Z axis direction. And this load magnitude is going to be the exact same magnitude as the slabs that we have. So negative zero, negative zero point, notes real quick negative 0 0.210, and this is going to be kip for feet. So we can click OK, and we can select graphically our member here and click OK. And so now you can see we have our um, member load here of 2.1 or 0.21 kip per feet. OK, so now I want to get into FE mesh. Down here, there's some buttons. Um, I want to turn off the grid just to make it a little more clear. And then up here, I can turn off the showing of our loads. So once you're done modeling with everything, you want to adjust your FB mesh depending on the size of your model. So there is a global FB mesh setting, which is up here under calculate. You can also find it at this button here. Uh, normally by default, this button just says display FE mesh. We can click on that 
and generate our FE mesh based on the default global FE mesh setting, which for imperial units is one foot by one foot. So each of these FE mesh blocks here are one foot by one foot, which actually looks really good um, for our plates here. If you want to adjust this mesh setting, you can hit this drop down arrow. And under mesh settings, actually, it's set to one and a half feet. So that's our target length globally for our whole model. Um, I do want to, for example purposes, adjust the FE mesh, FE mesh length for each of these plates. And so if you wanted to, let's say, adjust the FE mesh for one single surface, you can do that using what's called an FE mesh refinement. So in the left panel here in the navigator data panel, we can go to, so logically, if you're looking, you're looking for this um, FE mesh refinement for a surface, you would think, okay, let's go under types of surfaces. Um, we have some types of surfaces you can create here. And one of them says surface mesh refinements. So I don't have any defined right now, so I need to create some. So I'm just gonna double click on it. And this new surface, sorry, surface mesh refinement box will pop up and you can see it's creating one by default. Um, the target FE length for this first mesh refinement, let me just look at my notes real quick. Yeah, this first one's gonna be, we'll make this one seven foot. Um, and then down here, we can click on create new surface mesh refinement. So now we can have multiple definitions. This one's gonna be four feet, uh, create another one. This one's going to be 1.25 feet. And then our last one is going to be 0 0.4. Oops, did not type it in, 0 0.4. So now we have all of these FE mesh refinements. So let's say I just click OK. What did I do? Oh, oh, I typed it in up here. OK, yeah, no. So click OK. And so now on the left here, under surface mesh refinement, if I expand this uh, you can see that they're all blue so if you see anything that's blue inside of the inside of your data navigator here that means they're not assigned to anything in the model so they're all blue they're not assigned to any surface so what i can do is just right click or double click on one of them and you can see here i can go up here to assign the surface number you can select this graphically or if you know the surface number you could just type it in um, so i can select this graphically i want to select surface number one here for our seven foot um, fe mesh length four foot so like i said if you know the surface number that would be two and then this next one will make three and then this next one i'll just type in four i'll click ok it's telling me I need to delete the mesh because obviously I'm making new mesh refinements. And so our mesh is deleted. Um, you can see this, these symbols here. I made them yellow um, and they're letting you know that there's an FE mesh refinement assigned to the surface. And you can kind of see, you can get an idea of how large that FE mesh length is based on the little symbol, it changes depending on the length. And now let's say, yeah, so now we have our FE mesh refinements. I'm not going to generate the mesh yet, just um, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, the last thing I do want to add before we get into the results is uh, a results section to just better analyze the internal forces of our surface and compare them to our beam here. So I'm going to go up to this button set new results section and click on it. And this is where we can create our results section or create a results section. Um, basically there's a different types here, two points and a vector, that's fine. Um, show results section and direction. We want it to be in the positive local Z direction. And then all we need to do is define two points uh, to create the results section. So you can type in the coordinates if you wanted to. Um, you can select each point individually, but there's this button here that I can use to select two points graphically. 
So very easily I can snap to the mid span of the plate here, which is very helpful. So I'll left click on that and then I'm going to snap to the mid span at the end here. So now my results section is going to go through all of my surfaces here. Projection and direction, we want to project in the global Z direction. So now we can click OK. Um, and now we have our results section through all of our surfaces. And so now this is where we can run our results. So once you're finished with adding everything in to your model that you need to, you can run your results. There's a couple ways to do that. Uh, easiest way is to just go up here and click on Calculate All. So click on Calculate All. What it's going to do is now it's generating our mesh and we only have one load case. So should be pretty quick. It's just gonna calculate that one load case. And now we have our results. It automatically goes to our result tab and our result nav and the navigator on the left-hand side here. By default, the first thing that's shown is our global deformations and the resultant direction. Um, I can click on this cube up here and we can get a look at our deformations and do a visual, um, visual check of our deformations. So all of them, all of our deformations here basically look like how I would expect them, how the deformations I would expect to look for the loading and some boundaries that we've included here. So a good visual check of the deformations just to make sure your modeling is correct uh, is always good. Um, you can see the panel on the right-hand side here giving you the color uh, scale. So our max deformation is 0 0.02 inches. Um, so yeah, that's the result of the one load case. I know there was a question about seeing the maximum if you have, so the question was if you have a long list of load combinations and you don't want to manually go through each load combination to see which one is showing the maximum deformation what you can do is i'm just going to switch back i'm going to switch to the other uh, model real quick and you can see here in this other model if i go to the load cases and combinations um, dialog box. You can see I have multiple load combinations and I also have checked on my standards for combination wizard and classification, which will automatically based on the standard you select, automatically create load combinations based on that standard. So here we have our multiple load combinations, um, taking all of our load cases and com combining them. And then what that does is under this design situations tab, um, you can see here we have our strength limit state um, design situation, which takes all of the strength limit state load combinations, adds them um, or goes through them and chooses the minimum and maximum values. So this is a little um, further ahead than I want it to be, but we can just show that real quick. So if I, I can just run the calculation for this model real quick. Um, and you can see it run through the mesh. The nice thing about R from six is it can take advantage of um, multi-threading with your CPU. So you can see it can run all of the uh, load cases and combinations at the same simultaneously. So it's running through our load cases and combinations. You can see your convergence diagram on the right hand side here. And so now if I go under the, this design situation for LRFD or our strength um, design. I'm right now just showing the, right now I'm showing the maximum deformations. And let's say like the question was, what is the maximum deformation for our strength combinations? I would find that under here. So envelope, since our design situation one here is an envelope solution, right now it's showing the maximum and the minimum values. 
Um, I can show strictly the maximum deformation values. And then if you wanna know which load combination that is um, based on, if I turn my tables back on here and I go under the, let's see, static analysis overview, I would want to go under, well, you would choose, let's say results by member, um, global deformations, and then we would want to choose design situation. And it should say somewhere which load combination. Oh, of course, period. So you would find your maximum displacement and <clears throat> it'll tell you the corresponding loading that is um, corresponding with the maximum deformation. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, there might be a better way to do this, but this is the way I'm familiar with. So here you can see your deformations and you can choose, you can see the corresponding load combination. So. Um, um, Alex? Yeah. Uh, can you go to the overview quickly? I think that might be a little bit uh, more straightforward. Okay, yeah, I think you're actually so right. Here it just gives you the maximum, like it says CO2, CO3, right on the side too. If you do, if you don't care about like looking at each member or each surface. That's, yeah, thank you, Siska. That's a good point, yep. yeah. So thank you, That's thank yeah, you. thanks for that. Yeah, this, this is the maximum displacement in each of the directions. And I didn't realize, yeah, you can see the, um, which load combination that corresponds to right there, so. Awesome. Uh, that should answer your question. And we can get back to the example here. So now you should be able to see. Let me just check. OK, so now we want to take, we want to compare the results of our plates here with the result of our member. So I could turn off global deformations here by checking off this box. Um, and I can also turn off our results section for now. Uh, I wanna turn on results for members. So let's say for this beam here, I want to see the internal forces for this beam. So I can check on members and then I can expand internal forces. Right now, it's just showing um, our axial forces, which we don't really have any. So that makes sense because we just applied a uniform load. So what I want to do is check on MY. And this is the moment. So you can see the Y is lowercase, which um, indicates that this is the, these are the moments about the local Y axis of the member, which if I right click on the member, you can turn the local axis system of the member on or off there. So makes it a lot easier to, to just understand what you're looking at or the orientation of the, the axis, the local axis system. And so, yeah, this is our moment diagram. And I wanna compare this to the results of, or the moment, along our surface here. So if I turn on surface results simultaneously, I can go under internal forces. And under internal forces, I want to show the moment along the local axes, the local X axis of my surface. So our surface has a local X axis as well. And you can turn that on or off by right clicking on uh, any surface and turning it on. And so I'm going to check on moments MX, which is our moments along the X axis here. And now what I can do is turn on down here, our results sections. And so now we can get an idea of if I move this panel, I'm actually going to exit out of this panel. We don't need that right now. Now you can kind of get an idea of um, how FE mesh really affects your results because if I turn off results for a second, 
um, we can see that the FE mesh is very coarse, super coarse for this, for this panel here. And we go down the line and this panel, you, or slab, you can see that the FE mesh is super fine. So really the question is which, um, which FE mesh is the correct one to use. And I always say the rule of thumb when it comes to surfaces and FE mesh is that you wanna have at least four FE mesh elements in each direction. So this first one here, um, kind of have four in one direction, definitely don't have four in the other. This one here, we have four in one direction and more than four in the other direction. So this is kind of getting into the um, the correct idea. Another good rule, good rule of thumb when it comes to FE meshes um, is you want it to be as fine as necessary, but as coarse as possible. So if I turn on the results here and I'm going to go down here to results sections and turn on local extremes so we can see the maximum moment. You can see the maximum moment for this one is 8.44 kip, uh, kip per feet. Mm -hmm. But the finer the FE mesh gets, you can see how much that that actually gets closer and closer to our control beam here, which the maximum moment for our control beam here is negative 6.7 uh, kip per feet, or kip feet, I said kip. Yeah, negative 6.7 kip feet is the maximum moment here for our beam. And you can see the finer our mesh gets, the closer that our maximum moment for our um, for our slap here gets to that 6.706, 6.70. Um, yeah, so you can see why it's important to have your FE mesh as fine as um, necessary, but as coarse as possible. You may be asking, okay, well, I'll just make my FE mesh just super small. Um, small, like, what does it matter? I'll just make it super small for any of the slabs. And that's fine, but you have to keep in mind that the smaller your FE mesh gets, the more computation, computational um, computing power that takes to run the calculation. So you can do that, but if you have a large model with a lot of surfaces in it and you make your FE mesh super small, your, um, your computation time or your calculation time is going to take a really long time. And you might not even really be getting um, that more of, um, you might not even be getting that much more accurate of results because you can see between these two, this one's 6.72 um, and this one goes down to 6.7. So the, that's up to you as an engineer to determine, you know, um, that's up to you to determine what you think you, what accuracy you think you need. So good rule, um, have at least four FE mesh elements, at least four FE mesh elements in each direction on your surface. And um, a good phrase to live by is you want your FE mesh as fine as necessary, but as coarse as possible to save time in the calculation. So this kind of shows you um, how FE mesh really affects results in your model. So always good to keep that in mind. We can also take a look by right-clicking on our section here. Um, we can take a look at our uh, result diagram, which you can do for members as well if you really want to get into, um, if you really want to see in detail your shear um, diagrams and your mem your moment diagrams. But this just kind of really shows you how um, the FE mesh, like the finer it gets, the more accurate, the more points of data we have along our uh, diagrams here. So always just cool to see. Um, next thing to talk about is you're wondering, okay, this difference between these two, um, it could be 
well, the next subject I want to get into, actually, forget about that. The next subject I want to get into is hand calculations and comparing hand calculations to results in the diagram, results in the program. Um, if you're running a hand calculation for this beam, you're you're probably seeing something a little bit um, a little bit more, just a tiny bit more than what, or a tiny bit less actually than what the maximum moment is for this for this beam. And you could chalk that up to rounding errors or um, not having the most accurate um, or having the most significant figures when you're calculating. But really what that comes down to is uh, stiffness deformations and how the program takes into account stiffness deformations. Whereas with hand calculations, we don't take into account stiffness deformations. We assume that the I'm saying the shear deformations, I'm sorry. We don't take into account the shear deformations uh, in our hand calculations. We assume an infinite shear um, stiffness. So what the program does is assume a is assume that there is shear stiffness. And so the results are going to differ a little bit. And I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint to explain this further. So uh, Let's move. I did have a question actually I wanted to post or post for you guys. Um, oops, you might be seeing the answer. <laughs> okay, so the question before we get into um, shear stiffness and plate theory is, well, actually it is a fill in the blank kind of. So FE mesh, the FE mesh size should be, and if you could list uh, the answer, in that same questions panel, we can go over it. All right, so I'm seeing some answers. Um, yeah, most of you guys are correct. The So let's go over it. Uh, FE mesh size should be as coarse as necessary and as fine as possible. B, as fine as necessary and as coarse as possible. C, as precise as possible and as coarse as necessary. So the correct answer is B, which you guys got. So you want it to be you want it to be as small as you possibly can make it, so as fine as necessary, and as big as possible, as coarse as possible. You know, you don't want it to be so small that you're really not getting that much, you're, it's diminishing returns, you're really not getting that much more accuracy, and your calculation time is taking forever. Um, so you want it as fine as necessary, um, but then you want it to make, you want it to, you want to find that happy medium where you're getting good accurate results, but your calculation time isn't taking that long. So B is the, the correct answer. Okay, so now we're gonna get into so now we're gonna get into plate theory. Um, and to talk about plate theory, and um, I'm gonna use an analogy to beam elements or beam theory. So the first beam theory is Bernoulli's. And with Bernoulli's, oh, there we go. With Bernoulli's, this theory assumes that the cross section remains in plane and is also perpendicular to the member axes. We assume for Bernoulli's that there is no consideration. We don't consider any shear deformations and that the, stiffness, the shear stiffness is completely rigid. So that's Bernoulli's beam theory. 
And now let's compare that to the Timoshenko beam theory where the cross-section remains, we assume that the cross-section remains in plane, but we don't, um, sorry, but it's not, it doesn't remain perpendicular to the member axes. So we, we assume that, and by assuming that, we are taking into account shear deformation. Uh, we're taking into account shear deformations and um, the shear stiffness is limited and isn't completely rigid. So you can see how the um, deflection is going to change based for these two uh, theories. <clears throat> when I say that the member axis does not remain perpendicular to the member axis, you can see that you can see that for Bernoulli's that the that the that the cross section um, remains completely perpendicular with the member axes, whereas for the Timoshenko theory, we have our member axes, but our cross section does not remain completely perpendicular. We don't assume that it remains completely perpendicular to our member axes, which leads to um, more accurate results, but also uh, high, a little a tiny, a higher bit deflection um, for this, for Timo, the Timoshenko beam theory. So <clears throat> now I want to compare those two theories to plate theory. So the equivalent analogy for plate elements would be the Kirchhoff plate theory. Uh, for the Kirchhoff plate theory, we assume a geometrically linear um, deformation and we assume we, uh, we assume linear elastic material is being used, so that's based on Hooke's law. Then we assume that the cross sections remain flat and there's no warping. There's a constant thickness. And most importantly, there's no consideration of shear deformations when it comes to the Kirchhoff plate theory. So no shear deformations, basically pretty similar to Bernoulli's theory. For the resonant Midland theory, um, this is similar to the Timoshenko beam uh, theory. The first couple assumptions here are the same. The only assumptions that really change for this one is the we do consider uh, shear deformations in the Resner Midland theory, uh, which are, and we also consider taking into consideration transverse slash lateral strains. Uh, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with transverse lateral strains. We have this rod here, and as the rod is being pulled in tension, the cross section is shrinking because of the transverse transverse slash lateral strain. And so this is being taken into consideration uh, with the with the Resner Resner Midland theory for plates. So those are the two. These two theories are used in RFM. And so when it comes to plate elements, the Kirchhoff theory, again, no consideration of shear deformations. This one, this theory is good for thin plates, like uh, steel plates, steel, thin steel plates, something like that, where like they're not super thick, so you're not losing really any accuracy in your results and it's a simplified approach. So that's the Kirchhoff theory. Resonant Midland theory, you get more accurate results because you're taking into consideration uh, shear deformations. And so if you're modeling something like a thick concrete slab or like a foundation slab or something with a lot of thickness, then you want to, because the more thick the, the element is, the more your results are going to change because you're taking into consideration those shear deformations. So the shear influence for a component uh, is very high for thick plates. Um, if you're neglecting shear deformations for something for super thick plates, then you're going to have um, some significant errors in your results. Um, higher value approach, you're going to have more higher deformations, higher deflection, higher shear forces, um, but this is more accurate. So that 
is play theory. So I'm going to go back to RFM. And how does this, um, what does this have to do with RFM? So under the results, under my load case here, if I go to edit active load case, we can change the theory that's being used for our calculation. Um, so under our load case here, the, we're running our static analysis setting, our first one here. If I edit this, I can go under the basic settings tab and I can change um, between the plate bending theory, um, Reznor Minlin or the Kirchhoff. So if I change this to right, right now, sure deformations are being taken into account, all of that. Let's say I change this to the Kirchhoff and it's going to ask me, it's going to tell me you need to rerun your results because um, it's running a, a, a different theory. So now you can see, like I mentioned, before this was 6.7, 6.70 something. Now we're at 6.72 moment because we are now not taking into consideration um, shear deformations, and we're assuming the shear stiffness is is um, infinitely rigid. And if you're wondering, can we do the same thing with beams and members? We can. If you don't want to take into consideration shear stiffness and you want to compare this to hand calculations and just see if they match up, you can edit your section here and you can turn on this option called deactivate shear stiffness. Again, it's gonna ask you to rerun the calculations. Um, we can do that real quick. And now you can see, we are matching up now between our surface and our beam here. So that is a uh, plate theory and how it affects results in RFM. Um, so that is that is the first model example and um, everything about FE mesh and plate theory. Uh, I know we have ten minutes left, so are there? I'm going to look. Well, is there any questions that I can answer, Siska, in the chat? Uh, hey, Alex. Um, yeah. Can you show how to export the result uh, to Excel? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can do that. So, yeah, let's say you want to export uh, results from RFM to Excel, which is very easy. I'm going to go up here and turn my table back on. So that's actually, yeah, we should go over um, table results too. So static analysis, we're in the overview. This kind of gives you a sum of um, your results here. Let's say we go under <clears throat> uh, results by member. Let's just for keep this simple. Um, I'm gonna highlight this member and I'm gonna create a visibility by selected objects. So now we just have our member here. Um, let's say I want to go under internal forces here. So in the table here, you can see we have our uh, member number. We're looking at member number one. We have our, our node numbers here, location. We got our forces. Um, let's say we want to export this to Excel. So there's a button right here called export current table and it looks like Excel. So this button allows you to, it's gonna open my Excel. And uh, yeah, this is how you can export uh, results from RFM to Excel using the tables. Okay, thank you. There's, yeah, you're no, welcome. Other, there's no other questions. Okay, all right, sounds good. Um, I'm not gonna save this. Uh, so yeah, uh, tables. Yeah, I didn't really go over the tables too much. Um, you, for results though, yeah, you can view results uh, by node, by line, member. Um, yeah, so that's how the tables work. And this is basically it for this, this model. So what I'm going to do is start 
the other model. And <clears throat> the other model, I'm not going to start from scratch. I'm going to open a previously, I previously made this model. We're not going to remodel everything, but we are going to remodel some things. And so if you want to follow along with me, you can by I under the chat window in this go to training. Um, I included a link to our website, our webpage, where you probably want to register for this uh, training. And I'll click on that now and show you. Um, so if you are on our page here and you want to follow along with me, I uploaded this model to our page here. So it should be at the bottom here. Let me just refresh. It is... It doesn't look like this is the official last model, but it doesn't, oh, here it is, okay. So template design add-on example. You can download this from our website, which you can also see there's a lot of other models you can download from our website if you are interested in checking them out. Um, but you can download this one if you wanna start with me, um, auto along with me for this one. So that link is in the chat and we don't really have too much time left before two o'clock. Um, I'm just going to look at some other questions real quick. The lesson, yeah, this is recorded. So it will be posted later this week on our website. Uh, it should be posted under the same link that I just included on our website. So you can always come if you, you know, you can always come back to it if you want. So yeah, so this model, um, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint real quick and just explain it. We'll go over this. Actually, no, this would be a good time to go over these questions. So let's go over this question. So the, the plate theory of Kirchhoff does consider shear deformations. So this is a true or false, if I can get the, there we go. So if you could um, answer this in the in the questions, then we can go over it. All right, nice. You guys are all correct. Yep, it is. It is false. So, the plate theory of Kirchhoff. It says the plate theory of Kirchhoff does consider any shear does consider shear deformations, and that is false. It does not consider shear deformations in the Kirchhoff plate theory. So, um, yeah. Next question. Uh, where is the stiffness modified? Oh, wait, no, sorry. We're not doing that question. Not yet. Uh, I'm gonna go back to <clears throat> this question. Uh, oh, wait, no, not this question. Oh, that was actually the only question I had before we start the other model. Never mind. Okay, so good. Yeah. Um, now we can, oops. This next model, I'm probably just gonna explain, I think I'm just gonna explain this next model since, and we can just um, get into it tomorrow. So this model is our design add-on example. With this example, we're going to cover topics like load transfer surfaces. Uh, so that's a different type of surface where you can create the surface. It adds no uh, additional, additional stiffness to your model. It's strictly for distributing um, loading to members using uniform area loads. 
So we'll get into that tomorrow. Um, load case creation, we'll get into that based off of a standard. Um, some more element manipulation tools from that are similar to things like AutoCAD. And then the main um, topic will be design add-ons. So, and then we'll interpret interpret some results, uh, static results, similar to what we just covered, a little bit similar to what we covered today, maybe a little bit more in depth. And then timber design, steel design, and concrete design will go over. Um, we're gonna keep it simple with these designs, our design add-ons. We're not gonna get too in-depth. We're just going to be designing um, these three concrete columns here. Uh, and then we're going to design a couple, one or two of the joists, timber joists here in this mini structure. And then we're going to design um, two of these girders for the steel. So yeah, so that's gonna be the plan for tomorrow. Um, are there any other questions yet before we conclude for today? Yes. No question, yeah. Alex. Just for the recording and the certificate, which we will gotcha. send to after the two-day training. Yep. Thanks, Siska. Yeah. So we're not going to send that out tomorrow, but probably, yeah, you'll look out for that um, through email later later this week. So that's it for today. Um, if you have uh, any questions for the, later today or before tomorrow and you want to email us, feel free to email us. This is our technical support email. Um, we have a lot of people uh, that look at this email. So feel free to send in questions, models. Uh, that's free. And our phone number is here. Um, and yeah, thanks for everyone for participating today. Um, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you.